Good evening, everyone. Good evening. How are you all? My name's Jonathan O'Day. I'm the Speaker of the Legislative Assembly in the New South Wales Parliament. And I wanted to thank you all for joining us this evening for this Edmund Barton Lecture. Second year. It's uh, going to become a fine tradition in this Parliament. And as uh, we do every day when Parliament sits, and we were sitting for the last two weeks, so it's nice, uh, in a sense, to be here in a more relaxed atmosphere. But every day we um, make sure that we start parliamentary proceedings by acknowledging the traditional owners, and I'm going to do that now. So I acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, tonight, it is very much my pleasure to open officially the Edmund Barton Lecture. As I said, it's the second year, uh, second in a series of talks organised by the Parliamentary Communications, Education and Engagement Team. And they, um, in particular, have initiated this to celebrate the contribution of Australia's first Prime Minister, Edmund Barton, who was also Speaker of this Parliament in New South Wales, the Legislative Assembly that I preside over, from 1883 until 1887. He also served as Attorney General in, 19, in 1889 and again from 1891 to 1893. So this event tonight uh, will focus on the role of the Speaker in the Westminster system of government. Uh, last year we looked at the role of the Attorney General, which Edmund Button also filled. But tonight's panel, uh, we've got a discussion uh, which will be facilitated by Daniela, uh, in particular with the Clerk of the Legislative Assembly, Helen Minikin, and Simon Johnson, the Sergeant at Arms of the Legislative Assembly. And I'm also the third person on the panel. But Daniela, um, who's one of our senior education officers, will be the MC tonight and coordinate proceedings. But in the Westminster system of government, the office of Speaker is almost as old as the Parliament itself. And in the early days, many a Speaker met with a violent end at the hands of powerful monarchs who they reported to initially. But as the balance of power shifted from the monarch to the Parliament, the Speaker's survival became more of a decision of the house rather than the monarch, the king or the queen of the day. And as time went by, parliamentary procedure and expert parliamentary officers became increasingly important in maintaining order in the house. So I'm now going to join my colleagues in discussing the role of the speaker and those that work with the speaker. It does remain a challenging but also an interesting and exciting role in the Westminster parliamentary system across the world, and that includes very much in the New South Wales Parliament. Thank you. Daniela. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Yes. And uh, thank you, Mr Speaker, for your very warm welcome, and I'd like to thank our panel members tonight for making themselves available for this education program that has come at the end of the sitting year for Parliament, but also at the very end of the 57th Parliament. So it's fantastic. Thank you, everybody, for joining us, particularly in the lovely Jubilee Room, which was the Parliamentary Library and built to commemorate 50 years since 1856, when our New South Wales Constitution, which gave us a representative government, was created. So thank you everybody for joining us today. So just for your information, we are recording tonight's event and it will be available on the Parliamentary Education's website as soon as possible. So the procedure tonight, and I like using that word because I don't usually get to use that word, but these people on the panel are all about procedures and rules. The procedure tonight, I'm going to ask each of our panellists to say a little bit about themselves for a few minutes. We'll keep it really brief. I just want the audience to know like, who you are, what you do in the parliament. And then I've got a whole lot of questions that I'd like to ask each of you, a few to begin with for Mr Speaker, and then both for the clerk and the sergeant at arms. And then... I'll throw it open to some questions from the audience. 
we're aiming to finish at 6.25, so that'll that will mean uh, – that'll depend how many questions I can ask you. Okay. Let's um, – I might start with the clerk. Helen, could you uh, tell us a little bit about your role and what you do in the parliament? Uh, well, I became clerk in February 2017 and my role's uh, quite a varied role. I am a, pr a principal advisor on parliamentary law, practice and procedure. I'm a department head in a modern sense. I'm a CEO for the Department of the Legislative Assembly. Uh, I also have another role under the Constitution Act, which is um, I am the registrar of what's called the Pecuniary Interest Register, where members make their disclosures about their financial and other interests. If you like, I'm a little bit of a custodian and guardian in a much broader sense as well. And uh, I am what's called a commissioned officer. So uh, there are two commissioned officers for the Assembly, and that's Simon and myself, as Simon is Sergeant-at-Arms. Um, had a fairly long apprenticeship, but I'm the 19th clerk and uh, there's always been a clerk in the Assembly. So. Thank you for that insight. Simon, you're the Sergeant at Arms. What a terrific title. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about your role in this Parliament? Um, sure, I'll keep it short because I know there'll be lots of questions from you and then from the audience and I'm sure that'll tease out things you're actually interested in rather than things we want to tell you. But, uh, yes, yeah, Sergeant-at-Arms, it's the second best title in the in the Parliament. The best title goes to the my equivalent in the Legislative Council, which is the Usher of the Black Rod, which is a, <laughs> a fantastic um, uh, party icebreaker when, uh, when you're at barbecues, I'm sure, for her. Um, so... Uh, as Sergeant at Arms, I also have another title. I'm, I'm also a clerk assistant. So together with uh, the clerk and with the deputy clerk, who's with us, hello, Carly, uh, and other clerk assistants in the Legislative Assembly, we uh, actively support the House when it is sitting and also provide procedural advice when the House is not sitting. But I'll, I'll focus on the Sergeant at Arms role. Um, I guess historically that Sergeant at Arms role would have played more of an active um, security uh, role within the Parliament and these days uh, there is within the Department of Parliamentary Services an operational security um, uh, section which is uh, uh, augmented by special constables from the New South Wales Police Force. So, however, the, the commissioned officer, Sergeant, Sergeant at Arms position has an important uh, security role within the chamber and working with our chamber services team, of whom there are some in the audience today, and it's great to see you, um, uh, to maintain order in the House under the direction of the Speaker uh, and also to maintain order in the, in the precincts uh, generally under the direction of the President and the Speaker and working collaboratively with the Usher of the Black Rod. So there's an important protocol aspect as well as security aspect of the, the uh, Sergeant at Arms role uh, and some of that protocol you see uh, most uh, at the official opening of the parliaments, for example, at the beginning of each day, it'll be the Sergeant at Arms or the Deputy Sergeant at Arms who will walk in with the mace to signal the start of the day. Uh, and at thing, events like the recent proclamation of the new king, uh, there's a role for particularly the usher, but also the sergeant and the clerk and the speaker at, at those kinds of events. So I'll leave it at that and uh, we can talk more later. Thank you. So we often say that members of parliament are elected to perform two roles, representatives and legislators. Mr Speaker, you've taken on an additional role that of the Speaker of the Legislative Assembly. So would you outline what you do in the Chamber on a sitting day and also give us some examples of what you do on a non-sitting day as the Speaker? Sure, sure. Thanks, Daniela. Well, I came into the Parliament in 2007, uh, having had two careers, one in the law and one in business. And when I joined the Parliament in 2007, uh, it was as the member for Davidson originally uh, and as a a member of the parliament representing all of New South Wales as a legislature, legislator. Um, in 2019, um, I was elected to the role, additional role of speaker. And that role involves essentially three things, uh, three main functions. First one is representing the parliament, um, particularly legislative assembly with other organisations and other bodies. So for example, with the executive arm of government, with the legislative council, uh, with oversight bodies, with the diplomatic corps and with other organisations that want to engage with Parliament. So you're sort of a spokesperson um, along with others, but a spokesperson for the Parliament. Second broad function is overseeing the running of the precinct and that's in conjunction 
with the clerk of this, of this Legislative Assembly, the clerk of the other house, the Legislative Council, the president of that other house, and also the CEO of the Department of Parliamentary Services, which sort of provides corporate services across both houses. So that's the broadly the second. And the third broad function is promoting the interests of members collectively and presiding over the proceedings of the House. Now, that's the most visible uh, and, and publicly uh, you know, um, aware role. Uh, and, uh, and question time, obviously, is, uh, is the most high-profile part of the, of the day, but it's only relatively a small part of the overall role. Uh, but that role is important in making sure that proceedings of the House run smoothly and that order is maintained. Mm, terrific. So I'm going to throw some questions at the panel. Uh, the first few will be for Mr Speaker, but if the clerk and the sergeant at arms would like to add anything, that would be great. And then we'll I'll focus on the other two roles as well. And this might be a really obvious question, but why the name Speaker? Well, I suppose uh, it's because the Speaker is the mouthpiece for the House. Um, and, and certainly, um, in addition to, uh, perversely, I, it's better that I listen rather than speak too much, uh, but, but certainly uh, conveying messages and addresses from the House to the Governor uh, and, and, and also um, you know, to speak on behalf of the House, but also to uphold the privileges and the rights of, of members and speak on their behalf as well. Um, you know, Parliament um, comes in part from the... Uh, the French parlay. Um, I'm not sure where speaker derives from uh, you know, originally in terms of language, but it it pretty much is is what it yeah. sounds like. You're, you're a spokesperson on behalf of the house. So that sounds like um, a, a protocol and a, a procedurally based role. So then, why is it that as a newly elected speaker? Uh, I know this did happen to you as well. Why do newly elected speakers on the very first sitting day? Uh, once they're elected in the role of speaker, why do they get literally dragged to the chair? Because it doesn't sound like the kind of role that you wouldn't want. It sounds like a really interesting role, but you were dragged to the chair. Sure. Well, look, um, I, I was actually dragged physically, but um, I'll say towards the end of my term, and, I, and my term will, will uh, come to an end in May next year, not at the election, but in fact when the new parliament comes back, so the speaker stays on until uh, a replacement is elected by the new parliament. But um, as I head towards the end of my term, I'm a little bit more forthcoming in terms of sharing things, um, and I can share that when uh, the former Premier Gladys Berejiklian asked me to do the role, I was quite reluctant to do it. and. Um, uh, and I had, we had an understanding that I was going to do a different role. I was going to be a minister. Um, and so I wasn't that keen, actually, um, <laughs> and, and I didn't have my head in that space. Um, so in that sense, I was um, dragged both physically and metaphorically. Um, but I was really glad to, once I got into the role, I think it's a fantastic role. I think it's the, probably, for me, the best role that um, I could have played here. But, um, but why, why physically dragged? Um, well, the tradition goes back to the uh, UK, um, where many of our traditions do originate. And in fact, there were nine speakers, um, the last of whom was Sir Thomas More, um, who is in the Speaker's Garden as a reminder, um, who th those nine were executed. <laughs> uh, and originally, in my introduction, I indicated that originally the Speaker was accountable or spokesperson to the monarch of the day. And if the monarch of the day didn't like what they were being told, it was very easy. They'd just take off the speaker's head or, or execute them otherwise. And literally nine speakers were executed. So it was a quite a perilous um, you know, role to be in, um, culminating, as I said, uh, Thomas More was executed in, I think, 1535. And that's the last speaker that's um, been executed. Um, these days, um, it's a little less physically risky, although sometimes when I'm in the chamber, I'm very much uh, aware that my head could be taken off in a different way. <laughs> <laughs> um, did either of you want to add to that? Because I was wondering, is that because of that power shift from the sovereign to the parliament that that no longer happens? Is Well, I, I guess I was going to um, <clears throat> just say that uh, it's a great... It's, it's a useful reminder, I think. The, the, the physical act of being dragged up there demonstrates that there is a distinction between 
the Speaker as a member and the Speaker as the mouthpiece for the Parliament. And I'm sure you're going to go on to talk about this at some point, but you're often, the Speaker's often put in challenging situations at question time or, or at other times of tension in the House where uh, members of his political party might expect him to do a certain thing, but he is the Speaker of the Parliament. So it, it puts him in that challenging situation. So I suppose that physical dragging of him up is a reminder, a kind of a tangible reminder of the, of the political or um, metaphorical um, danger he might be in, if you might, don't mind me saying so. No, 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 I think that's all true too. Although I think the tradition originated... Sure, in actual having your head chopped yes, off, yeah. yes. which is no danger <laughs> yes, now, but at right. least as far as I know. Yeah. But you're absolutely right. Um, you know, and, and being dragged to the chair, um, it's, it, I think it's also indicative that you should be you know, dragged there as a servant of the house, um, not as the master of the house. Um, I'm there at the will of the house, and the house asks me to exercise my authority uh, in a firm but fair way. And, uh, but I'm always the servant of the house. Yeah. Thank you. And I think that's obviously why we um, continue this tradition to this day. And I do remember after a, one of the, uh, an election about eight years ago that a journalist in one of our mainstream newspapers had been watching these proceedings and, had, and really ridiculed it in writing this tradition and said it was old fashioned, what's the point? And I did get quite annoyed at that because I totally agree. It is, some, it is a reminder of the speaker's role, uh, contemporary role, but also the historical reminder of the, the dangerous reality in a time before our democracy was quite as um, rule-based as it is now. Thank you. So for the speaker and the clerk, how do the speaker and the clerk work together, particularly on a sitting day? What, what happens? Uh, look, I think... Um these roles are roles where you see in public a small tip of the iceberg. And so there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes. There's a lot of bringing together um, different parts of the day from different players, different office holders that the speaker would interact with and that um, I as clerk would interact with. Um, but principally, I would be um, providing the speaker with more... Um, routine matters in advance of coming into something like question time. Uh, and uh, then in the house, it's more, you, you know, that you get up on more complex things perhaps or some things where the speaker might want you to find something for him. Um, but uh, there's a whole range of sorts of different questions that can arise in a, in a day and, and some of them will be quite simple, others will be quite complex. But we have a debrief just before question time where we um, sort of anticipate uh, as much as possible what, what might happen. You have to have a lot of political nous in the job. I read the papers in the morning the same way as ministerial um, staff do at 5am and sort of set myself up for the day and try and keep tabs on things through the day. Um, and that's just in relation to the, the things that sort of happen around a sitting day. So a sitting day does have quite a rhythm to it and you structure your day according to the different parts of the puzzle that all come together um, throughout the course of the day. Can I throw in a question? A sitting day has, is quite long normally, uh, 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. at least. But neither of you, and, and Simon as well, neither the speaker nor the clerks, do you sit all day? Do you, are you on all day or do you have, can you rotate with other people? You have acting speakers and really acting... Really good rosters, Daniela. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the speaker has a panel? Indeed, indeed. I'll just add to the early questions. The clerk, um, um, Helen, is, is very knowledgeable and very capable um, and, and the clerks and the team of clerks um, have, uh, and we've got Simon and we've got Carly who's in the audience uh, and Jonathan who's also um, an assistant clerk. The four of them are the senior clerks um, for the Legislative Assembly. They're all knowledgeable. They've been here for a while. They build up expertise. Speakers just come and go. Uh, <laughs> so, so while we, we try and, um, you know, sort of, uh, and, and, and you do have to exercise judgment and and at least make people think that you're in control and you know what you're doing. But there are occasions also in the chair where I will seek the advice of the clerks. Um, I don't do it too often, 
but when I do, I know that there's um, expertise and, uh, and a resource there that can help me. Uh, but we do try and anticipate if there's issues, as Helen said, before, uh, before a question time or before the sitting day. Yeah. Um, so sometimes I've seen the clerk uh, whisper to the speaker. Is that, a, does that, is that just a method of communicating so that nobody else hears or is it... Is it an emergency? What What is happening? No, when no, she's, she's usually telling me, throw out that member, that member and that member. Not at all. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> That's just what I'm thinking. <laughs> There's a red button on my desk, Daniela, and the red button goes off and then I uh, leap to my feet. So it's, it's, just a, it's just communicating. It's, look, yeah. yeah, we don't do it electronically. Um, I, I have... Um, different people work different ways. Uh, I have given to advice to different office holders via text message. I don't find it to be the most... Uh, um, you know, uh, detailed way of actually conveying things, but, you know, I've learnt to do it in 60 characters or less in a text. Um, but, you know, for Mr Speaker, it's it's much more about being able to um, speak quickly and, and give out advice on fairly nuanced things um, according to whatever I've been asked, yeah. I think um, some of the things to sort of keep in mind is through the course of the day... Clerks will be providing advice to all members of the House equally on potentially the same thing. And we don't breach the confidences of any of those things um, between... So I, I, at the beginning of a, a sitting day um, or going to question time, I, you can sort of define my role by the things I exclude. So I, I don't help the Speaker with tactics. I can't... If there's a... The government doesn't always tell the speaker what they want to do as well. So, so there's a lot of uh, um, discussion in, in, in a way around the proceedings as well that you can't actually disclose. But you always go into the chamber um, fully equipped to empower the speaker to make whatever decisions he has to make when, when he's in that position. And he can completely disregard my advice and that's all good too. Thank you. And I think I've got... A, I'm going to ask you a question later about some of those decisions, those rulings and, and how that works. But I wanted to just throw over to Simon for a moment and go back perhaps a little bit historically like we did with the Speaker. Uh, the Sergeant at Arms, why you called that and why do you carry a mace? And we, we didn't bring our fake mace in, yeah. but tell us a little bit about that part of your role. Yeah, well, um, I guess... Uh, uh, my problem, when the usher of the Black Rod goes to a barbecue and says, I'm the usher of the Black Rod, there's kind of, you know, blank looks. But if, if I say I'm the sergeant at arms, they say, well, which bikey gang is it that you're the sergeant <laughs> at arms for? Uh, so, yeah, look, it's a bit of a different um, story. Um, I'm by no means an expert in the history of the um, evolution of the sergeant at arms. We do have some uh, quite, uh, quite experienced uh, former sergeant at arms in the audience with uh, Les Gagné, but he might... Um, uh, have an insight a bit later on. But I would say that um, uh, the Sergeant at Arms, the, I did look into the kind of origins of the Sergeant at Arms when I took on the role. And uh, essentially, um, in the early days of the monarchy, the Royal Sergeants at Arms were, were this kind of, you know, when I, when I read about it, it looks a little bit like they're a kind of a goon squad, you know, a, a kind of enforcer squad for the, for the king, that they're sent out and they in, enforce the, the, the monarch's will on the, on the people of, uh, of um, you know, the 1400s in, uh, in the UK. So, you know, and they literally had a, a mace, which was a, a weapon of war. Um, and there was a time, uh, you know, at which the House of Commons was complaining about the the kind of um, the way in which the royal sergeants at arms were going out and performing their duties in a kind of slightly cavalier way. And they, they stopped complaining when they got their own. So they got their own sergeant at arms uh, allocated to them. And I'm, I can see that uh, Hayley and Luvo and David are in the audience here. They probably know more about this kind of stuff than I do as the people who deliver the tours to, uh, to, to visitors to the parliament. But anyway, so the, the House of Commons in the UK got their own sergeant at arms and, and that became their kind of enforcer, um, somebody who could go and collect people to, to um, appear before the House of Commons, if that was the will of the House. And there, there was, was a kind of penal element as well to the House of Commons, which I'm glad to say we don't have currently here in New South Wales, or at least we're not going to test. Um, so, yeah, so, and one of the other interesting things was that this mace, uh, uh, in times of uh, kind of high levels of low literacy, uh, the mace is a very useful way of demonstrating your authority. So it would have the royal seal if you're a royal sergeant at arms, or it might have the, the house seal. 
Um, but I do like to think of, of the fact that when you turn up to somebody's house, you know, requesting the £10 you owe the, the king, and they say, why are you asking, you know, what, what authority do you have? And then you hold up this weapon of war, <laughs> and you're actually showing them the, the little seal, but all they can see is the weapon of war. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, okay, I will hand over the £10. So it does show the kind of slightly, um, you know, the slightly murky waters from which our own... Um, avatar parliamentary democracy emerges. But, yeah, so that's where it came from, basically. The Sergeant at Arms was loaned uh, to, the, um, to the House of Commons and then uh, retained by the House of Commons and became the House of Commons um, uh, Sergeant at Arms rather than a Royal Sergeant at Arms. And have you had to strong arm anybody in well, that's the Well, that's the other thing that there's... Uh, on the Speaker's direction, we will um, remove members from the House, but they generally are well out of the, uh, the chamber before we get anywhere near them. So, um, yeah, you kind of, you know, waddle after them <laughs> as, they, as they leave the, uh, the chamber. And often that'll be the deputy sergeant at arms who does that. Um, but, you know, it could be either of us. Fantastic. So I've got a... Thank you, Simon. A, a question for Mr Speaker, but also um, the other panel members if they want to add anything. Uh, and we briefly mentioned rulings before. There are many rulings that apply to the proceedings of the House. My understanding is that it's essentially a meeting that's happening... Uh, and there are lots of rules to how that meeting is conducted and Mr Speaker is the chair of that meeting. That's my simplistic version of that. What's the Speaker's role in relation to these rulings? Sure. So I, I'm asked by the members on occasion to make rulings pursuant to the standing and sessional orders. So they're the, sort of the rules that the House sets for itself that need to be enforced and, and respected by members of the House. And if members transgress or, or they're arguably transgressing, then, uh, then I've got a role in ruling on whether or not somebody who's speaking at the time usually, but sometimes it may be people who are otherwise in the chamber who are being either disorderly or not being respectful or obeying those standing orders. So I get to enforce them um, by ruling. Uh, I also have a, have a role in if, uh, if they're being breached uh, by people in the chamber other than those speaking, potentially putting them on a call or I could put the person who's speaking on call. And if you're on three calls, if you put on three calls, sort of three warnings, it's a bit like a school, school uh, uh, classroom. You know, give them a few warnings, but if they if they do want to keep on, um, you know, behaving badly, um, or or ignoring the standing orders, then the option is to ask them to leave the chamber, either for a period of time or overnight. Thank you. And did did you want to add anything at your role in in that? Uh, so. When Mr. Speaker said uh, he makes rulings, quite often. Um, in addition to actually making a, a ruling about the situation in front of him, he's actually filling in gaps, if you like, between um, what's specified in the rules and, um, you know, the actual meaning that sits behind that because a lot of it's informed by practice. You can't encapsulate everything in a rule. So um, he's literally interpreting the rules of the House and I think uh, the other aspect of it is, is that... Um, while the Speaker uh, provides that interpretation to the House, there's also the avenue for the House to dispute a ruling of the Speaker, which is called dissenting from a Speaker's ruling. Never happened. <laughs> managed to get through without that happening. But it's, it sort of uh, is an indicator that the ultimate authority resides in the House. And so if you actually had a dissent ruling that was moved and then passed, it's, it's more or less saying the House has no confidence in the Speaker's ability to do the job. So, you know, these are the sort of, you know, um, territories you don't want to go to, but it's, uh, it's always open to the House to say that, to, to criticise in a way what the Speaker has done. Mm. Has that happened often in the past? That Potentially, it yes. Has, it has, yeah. Well, yes, no, it has happened in the past and, um, yeah, speakers have saved themselves on dissent motions by their own casting vote. Ah, and that's a question I'm going to come to. Um, before we go there, so we were talking a little bit about question time before and maintaining order. You've probably answered it. it how do you maintain order? We, we've all seen some question times in the Legislative Assembly, in the Federal Parliament House of Reps as well, and I must say in our Legislative Council as well. They can get rather rowdy. And when I've watched those, I can, I can see what the tactics are. 
there. Some people will say, oh, it's like a naughty classroom and you, you should have more order. Whereas I can see what the tactics are. And I know that there's media waiting outside to speak to any members that are kicked out and then they'll get first go in the news at, at explaining their point of view. So how do you maintain that balance as a speaker between saying, no, you've broken a rule, out you go, and no, I don't really want to give you that um, satisfaction of being kicked out so you can perhaps yeah. talk to the media? I, I think very few people get satisfaction from having to leave and, and I get no satisfaction from asking people to leave. I really don't like doing that. But um, sometimes people don't give you that option. Um, but that's very much exercising a power. I think the far more compelling and better way to maintain order is to try and engender um, a, an atmosphere um, and a, a mood of respect um, for the rules and for other people in the parliament, uh, other members, the speaker who is ever, ever in the chair, and the institution, as well as the public, uh, whether they're the public in the gallery or who are just watching on. Um, and I think during the term of this parliament, we have improved that, um, the behaviours. Um, you know, culturally, it's, it's very difficult to change uh, a traditional, very antagonistic at times, vitriolic uh, in the past. But I actually think that the mood has improved uh, in this parliament. Um, but that's engendered, as I said, from um, a, a, a greater sense of respect. Uh, but from my perspective, I can influence that if I'm seen to be fair and impartial, um, then people are more likely to be respectful and feel as though they're going to get a good go. Having said that, there are some people occasionally who don't so much aim to get thrown out, but they want to be noticed by the cameras or they want to you know, perform for their colleagues um, you know, and just make a bit of a name for themselves. Uh, and so there can be over-exuberance or uh, too enthusiastic interpretation of what they're allowed to do. Um, so sometimes that does result in, in asking people to leave. And when you are um, in the speaker's chair, you are the speaker, so, and you are impartial and fair... Try to be. <laughs> Try to be. Do you ever then get a chance to contribute to debates or to, to vote on bills? How does that work? So, so I'll only vote on a bill on legislation before the House um, if I'm in the chair um, because sometimes, as we spoke before, other people will be in the chair and I will take their place effectively voting on behalf of the government. But if I'm in the chair, I will only vote on the legislation um, by way of a casting vote if the votes are tied. And there's protocols in terms of how you'd exercise that power as exercising a casting vote. But otherwise, I can still contribute as a local member of parliament, particularly speaking on what are called community recognition notices or private member statements, which are statements um, or speech, short speeches about my electorate uh, and uh, acknowledging or uh, celebrating or uh, conveying some important information about a person or an event or, or something to do with my electorate or the broader community. Be non-controversial and, and it won't sort of be critical of the government or, or the opposition. Um, so I'll take a, a, a more diplomatic role but still fiercely represent my electorate. Yeah. Did you want to add anything to that? I think so. I think I I've just want to throw some... Well, I suppose I should say it did follow a constitutional amendment um, when we had Speaker Torbay, uh, who was an independent, who actually wanted to be able to contribute from the floor. So there was a constitutional amendment to allow for that to happen. So can you help me out on this? On bills. A constitution, so our New South Wales constitution was actually amended so that the independent speaker, because he didn't have a political party to, to swap into... No, just to provide, to provide that he could leave the chair and participate. And being myself, being a clerkly person, I did actually bring that down with me. Uh, so it wasn't able to happen before? No. Ah, and, and, okay. and my personal view is I don't think that's appropriate. But it's, it is appropriate now because it's in the Constitution. Right. <laughs> but but I, I, would, I would personally feel uncomfortable about contributing to legislation um, as Speaker. That's a very interesting uh, con um, addition there. Thank you. I've got some questions for the clerk. And 
about your constitutional role as the clerk in the Legislative Assembly. Can you tell us a little bit about what that means? I think you mentioned earlier that you're a commissioned officer. Yes, so there's, uh, there's a, a couple of aspects to it. So I, I do have specific roles that are assigned under the constitution that you will see when we have the next election. After that, when the House first sits, um, I'm required to preside over the proceedings because at that point we don't actually have a speaker elected. So um, for a very short period of time, when we go through the formalities of returning the writs, and swearing in members, I preside over that section. But the very first big decision that the House makes is the election of the Speaker and who they wish to have preside. Once that happens, I step back into my clerk role. So that's a, a quite specific assigned role. Then there's, uh, I suppose, what we call more of a custodian role in that bigger constitutional sense. So um, the Speaker is, uh, as the head of the house, somebody who lays claim to the rights and um, privileges of the house, which uh, when you're talking about traditions, there's uh, set pieces on that very first day of all those ceremonies which actually mean things. And so we perpetually pass the evidence bill every single time we have an official opening. It's the same bill all the time. And it's really a symbolic um, statement of the fact that the House is laying claim to be able to conduct business without needing the authority of the Crown and it lays claim to all its privileges and the Speaker presents that um, to the... in as part of a ceremony, presents that uh, to the Governor. So, um, you know, uh, there's those sort of bigger constitutional um, questions that I provide advice on that uh, in the course of giving advice to the House and the members and its and its committees uh, that I have at the back of my mind principles that aren't necessarily laid out in the Constitution and how we might give uh, effect to those principles. Thank you. Uh, you're not the only clerk in the Parliament. We, you're the clerk of the Legislative Assembly and, of course, we have the clerk of the Legislative Council and I don't think he's here tonight. Can you tell us a little bit about how you work together in relation to the two houses being a bicameral system? Yes, yeah, so it's very interesting. So the two houses, are, we refer to them as being separate and sovereign. Um, the two houses as a construct um, combined with the, the governor are, if you like, the, the legal entity that is parliament. In a, lit, a little bit uh, of an analogy, that's pretty much like my role and relationship with David. So we're respectful of our separate roles. We're respectful of the positions that our house, each house might take on something. So we can quite often be um, representing um, or dealing with each other on negotiations or procedural things where we stand quite apart and we're providing advice that is quite... Um, you know, at opposite ends of the spectrum to our respective um, members and, and the houses. But uh, you always have to make it work. So it is a, a relationship. I have nothing but the utmost respect um, for the other clerk. And uh, I think in more recent times, we've also um, had some good demonstrations of uh, communications and negotiations where we have to come together to ensure that the houses can achieve a common outcome. So that um, has happened in relation to some um, procedures that we have in place around um, offices that the houses have set up to deal with complaints, things like that. There's protocols and procedures around that. And so David and I are working to our uh, two respective privileges committees, bringing forward um, procedures that that are amenable to being able to work constructively together. So, yeah, I think that's a pretty good summary. Mm. Thank you. Um, I've got one more question and then I'm going to throw it to our audience for, question, for questions, so prepare yourselves, I want to hear some. And it's a question about our system of government, which we call the Westminster system. Can you tell us why we call it that, if any of you want to answer, and, and what does it mean? Well, well, it really comes from Westminster, which is in, in the UK, but I'll, I'll give someone else a go. <laughs> so. I mean, yeah, I'm, I could have a crack at it, but uh, I mean, basically... Look, it's, I never you know, like to come to say. anything unprepared, so of course, <laughs> you, you know, 
that is one of the, the things that we always prepare for on every single um, course that we've run for other clerks in other jurisdictions and things like that. So it, it, essentially, as Mr Speaker said, it's called a Westminster system because initially uh, the Commons used to follow the used to follow the king around, if you like. So the king would sort of convene parliament in order to get money. And we and the parliament would go wherever the king was. But then eventually uh, the monarchy sort of vacated Westminster, the palace of Westminster, and parliament over time took uh, up residence, if you like, and that became the home of the two houses of parliament. So that's the sort of, it's always good when you're thinking about traditions to actually, and, and why things have meanings, to go all the way back and just unpack it because quite often it makes a lot more sense. Um, what you then have is over time, a number of uh, other jurisdictions that take on um, and model their uh, system of parliamentary government off that system that grew up at Westminster being the two house of houses. And, and you see, um, particular aspects of that system of government replicated across um, countries in the Commonwealth, and it will be the Westminster is sort of, is talking about um, the sort of checks and balances that exist between the three branches of government: the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary. And they're quite complex, and they're quite distinct from the American sort of system. So, so yeah, you see things like you know ministers. Um, you know, uh, uh, res reside in, in the House and ministerial responsibility, uh, that sort of convention, um, they're all modelled on what came out of Westminster. With a couple of elements from the US as well. But, yeah. But, but, you know, some but, people but, will yeah, say yeah, yeah. there's more presidential aspects to our current Westminster yeah. system. So there's lots of debates around that, but essentially you're talking about, yeah, yeah those principles. Absolutely. And those three independent arms, people don't realise, you know, that... That's the essence of sort of the Westminster system. You've got checks and balances between those three independent arms. A lot of people, when they you talk about the government, people just think, oh, yeah, no, the Premier runs everything. Well, the executive is dominant in the system, but the legislature um, must be a check on the executive exercise of power. Um, and sometimes that gets a little bit out of whack, but um, that's uh, modern politics. And it's, it's easy to slip into Westminster, isn't it? But it's Westminster. Does Minster mean church? Is that Westminster Abbey. Westminster York Abbey? Minster. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But in terms of the context, of it, it is, yeah, Westminster. Mm. Thank As you. In, yeah. The Westminster is the Western, the Minister for Western <laughs> for Sydney. Western Sydney. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So we have a Westminster system. Yeah. Yeah. Westminster. Yeah. Thank you for answering my questions. Now, I'm absolutely sure that there are questions here. And Megan is going to give a roving mic, first of all, to the gentleman up the front. If um, when you get the mic, could you just tell us your name and then answer the question? That would be wonderful. And hand your mic back to Megan and she'll find the next person. I'm a lay person, and so I don't know a great deal about this, but I'd address the speaker. Now, we all remember some of the one-liners of Winston Churchill. <laughs> now, obviously, with people going in at 10 o'clock and coming out at 7 o'clock, it's a pretty long day. What is the position with humour from your point of view? And it must be a hard one because I'm sure there's got to be a bit of humour, but it can go a little bit too far. It can. There's there's humour and there's humour. And generally, if it's funny humour, which is in good nature, you let someone get away with it more often than other other disruptive comments. If it's really witty, um, there's certain types of humour that I just won't stand for. And right at the beginning, for, so for example, it used to happen in the previous parliament, and I'd hate it. And I can say this because I'm a tall person, but I would hate it when people would stand up who were short in stature, and they'd, and they'd, and then people would yell out, "Oh, stand up, stand up!" That sort of thing. Just it's just you know, if people sort of attack people based on their physical appearance. That's just not on, and so I just have no tolerance for that. Uh, some people think that's funny. It's not funny. It's it's just deprecating. It's not it's not funny. So that sort of humour, no. Uh, but if it's really witty humour. Um, then I think everyone has a degree of tolerance, you know, for the interjection that's really witty and, 
Uh, and you, as, as I said, as a speaker, I'm less inclined to call them, you know, sort of pull them up or... or, or and likewise, if a minister is, is giving a really witty response, um, which is appreciated by the House, you let them be a little less relevant to the question than you might otherwise. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, up the back. And just uh, tell us who you are. Thank you for a very informative talk and the roles of the speaker, the Sergeant Arms, and the clerk. My question is, could you give us an example, speaker, of a situation that was really escalating and you used your skills to de-escalate that situation? Oh, look, well, that happens... Um, sometimes outside the chamber as well, but um, but look in a, in the chamber. Um, if if things really escalate and really get tough, what I'll do is I'll stand. Okay, that's if it really gets heated or it's sort of looks as though it's really going out of control. And, and if you stand as a speaker, that's serious. Everyone sits down and everyone is immediately quiet. And if they don't, then they'll be asked to leave the chamber. So that's. An easy way to do it. I don't have to raise my voice, um, and when I stand, I've got a bit of physical presence as well. So I don't use it too often, but it's pretty effective when I do use it. Yeah. Is that is that a rule? Did you or did you come up? Is that common? I think it's that's convention. What, is that a convention to yeah. stand? Yeah, you see footage yeah. of people yeah. in the Commons do it, and yeah, it's a convention. It's quite um, obviously, Mr. Speaker's quite tall. I can't yeah. see it. I can only see a reflection in the yeah um, TV, in the mon monitor of the computer. Sometimes now we stood up just because it's become a bit quieter. <laughs> and that is, I, I really like that idea too. That you don't need to raise your voice. That that quietness actually um, inspires quietness. Thank you. you. You'll hear speakers go, "I'm on my feet," and it actually really is meant to mean something. Yeah. Got time for one or two more questions before we wrap up. So if anybody speak now or forever hold your peace. Aha, uh -huh, thank you. And then we've got... <laughs> thank you very much for an excellent talk. Um, I work at New South Wales Treasury and Mr Speaker, I'd love to see you wear the wig. Daniel, I brought it in. Did you know I brought it in? <laughs> so... So speakers of old, uh, the last speaker to wear this was 20, over 27 years ago, um, Speaker Kevin Rizzoli. Uh, and I've never worn this in the chamber. I brought it in on my last speaking day, which was last Thursday. Uh, I brought it into the chamber and I just teased the chamber a bit by leaving it there on the stand. I didn't want to put it on. Uh, I, didn't, I was urged to, to wear it on the last day, as indeed I was urged to wear it um, with the proclamation of the new monarch. Um, but for me... It, it is, a, a, you know, for some people, it's a, it's a valuable tradition. It may well be worn by future speakers. But for me, it's a bit archaic. It's not consistent with my, I suppose, notion of, of the speaker. So I'm not going to wear it now. I have put it on, maybe when the TV camera's off. But I, what I do do <laughs> is I do still wear the wig, um, which is a sort of a, 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 not the wig, uh, the gown, sorry. I don't wear the wig. I wear a gown. Um, and, uh, and that's sort of differentiating you in a sense from other members, but it's not going as far as wearing the wig, which, as I said, um, ha has had its place, may have a place in the future, but not for, not for this speaker. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And I think we've got time for one final question, if anybody has one. Yeah, oh, look, we've got two questions. So, yes, so perhaps, yeah, so if you want to go first and then the, the lovely lady there. Um, the clerk mentioned changing the constitution. Can the constitution of New South Wales be changed without a referendum? But yes. the constitution of the, which, of the Commonwealth, which is enumerated, has to be by a referendum. Am I so it's, it wasn't an entrenched provision that they... <laughs> that they changed. So yes, you could amend that particular section like an or any ordinary um, act. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, one more question there, coming up. <coughs> yeah. Hi, um, 
I have a question for Mr. Speaker in the class as well. So, Mr. Speaker, what's the most interesting or difficult um, ruling you have ever had to make um, during your time? And also for the class, what was the most satisfying like advice that you have ever given and, and was it accepted by the speaker? <laughs> Oh, okay. Look, when there's really difficult rulings, um, I, I'm so lucky. I'm supported in my office by some fantastic staff <laughs> members. It's a Dorothy and, Dixer. And, a Dorothy Dixer. And, and they will advise me. But if it's a really tricky ruling, um, I'll t I can take it on notice. And particularly early on, I did that with a few a few rulings. Um, some of the tricky ones include if 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 um, if you're introducing a money bill, now that's come up a couple of times, uh, where members who are not ministers are not meant to introduce measures in the House that impact on the finances of the government. That's in a, a, a sort of a rough uh, interpretation. Likewise, there are, uh, there are cases where, uh, or instances where um, certain amendments might be for other reasons um, just not appropriate. Um, or, or, or consistent with the, you know, the objects of the bill or the, or the legislation that it's intending to amend. Uh, certain standing orders, nuances there where someone's taken a particular point of order. So often I'll make a ruling there and then, but on the really tricky ones, I can take it on advisement and just think about it overnight even if I want to. And there's been a few of those, not for a little while, but, um, but I'll seek advice from as I said, my staff and the clerks on those sorts of things. Yeah. And the other part of the question was about... Most satisfying. <laughs> yes, most satisfying advice you've given. Um, look, it's quite difficult. I don't think the things that are... Satisfying is an interesting word. So there are some things that you get time to prepare and provide advice on, and they, as Mr Speaker said, can be the ones, the rulings that are taken away and you've got more time. I think the things that I'm um, more satisfied with my performance on, if that's the right sort of approach, um, would be the things where you have no prior knowledge of what's about to happen and you provide advice with the cameras rolling uh, within... 60 seconds or so and you get it right because uh, one of the aspects of the job is not to get too much wrong um, but you, you get it right and and then it can become something that actually is referred to later on and has a, a bit more of an ongoing life so I think um, and the example that I, I can talk about that comes to mind is when um, we had we're in question time there was a particular case, that uh, sexual offence case, that had been aired in the media. Um, there was a question on notice given to um, one of the ministers about it. And at that particular juncture, because I get up at 5am and read the papers, the name meant something to me. This is why you've got to sort of be across things. The name meant something and then I then had the situation of, well, has that person be char been charged? Once a criminal charge is laid, then... Uh, conventions such as what we call sub judice, which is about uh, the House not encroaching on matters that might be subject to legal proceedings, becomes much more significant once a criminal charge has been laid. So I couldn't find out from the quick, you know, searches I could do on the phone as to whether or not a charge had been laid. So I wrote a ruling in about less than 60 seconds, gave it to the then speaker who uh, read it and I managed to write something coherent that upheld the principles and um, is something that I still periodically have in the back of the book for the same situation when I might need the same thing. Short, pithy, got the message across to the members in the House and uh, they took it very seriously. So for me, that was quite satisfying because it upheld those sorts of uh, respective sort of jurisdictions we have um, between the three different branches of government. So we call it comity and, and the House tries not to encroach on, on the courts um, so that it, it does not unnecessarily interfere with uh, legal proceedings. So yeah, that was probably a good example. <laughs> Oh, thank you. And look, thank you for your terrific questions. I know one of the reasons I love to organise these events with our education team is because we learn so much every single time, even though we've worked here for a while. 
Uh, and those questions really brought out some terrific insights into all three of the roles here tonight. So if you could join me in a round of applause for our three panellists. Thank you so much for being here, particularly at the end of uh, the sitting period. And can we give our speaker for the 57th Parliament a huge round of applause for all the work he's done and all the support that he's given to the Parliament over the four years? Thank you. And of course, we certainly could not hold these events without you. Uh, it would be a rather different event. So please thank yourselves and give yourselves a round of applause. Thank you for being here. Uh, the recording will be available very soon on our website. If you're interested in our events, just have a look on our uh, website for future events uh, and let us know and we hope to see you here again. I'll be sending a survey out to you as well. So please let us know if this is the kind of event that you want more of and please give us any advice on how we could do this sort of thing better. And can, so, can I just say, yes. Daniela, um, that this parliament's really tried to modernise, not just in terms of the capital, but also in terms of the way we do things. But hand in hand with that, uh, we've put a real priority on increasing the engagement, the education and the connection with the public. And the communications, engagement and education team are doing a fantastic job, um, led by a number of people who are here tonight, but, um, but involving a whole lot of people across the parliament. And, and there, we got so many really good people across this parliament. But tonight you've um, um, seen an example of Daniela um, executing some of those plans really well. There's a whole lot of uh, good stuff and I just want to thank her. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank, you. thank you very much. So thank you everybody and enjoy your rest of your evening.